Hi everybody, I think there's 104 of you on. Um, so Paul Bradshaw, who some of you will know, is also a data journalist. Uh, he is also an educator, he's course leader at Birmingham City University, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, but he's also founder of Hacks Hackers Birmingham. Uh, so he is, he is part of the part of our community as well. Um, so Paul's going to talk to us. He wrote a blog, blog post, which I noticed a couple of week, a, weeks ago, about the different cognitive biases. So without further ado, over to you, Paul. Thank you very much. I hope you can um, hear me okay. Um, I'll, um, I'll quickly switch to sharing my screen, if I can find the right one. Um, so yeah, this was uh, this is quite odd not to be talking about data specifically. Um, uh, this, this is something that I've been teaching at, um, at Birmingham City University for the last couple of years, particularly actually around statistics as well. It, it, it uh, ties in quite well with that. And um, I'll just try and illustrate this. I'll keep an eye on the chat and, and check you can see my screen. But um, let's move some stuff and bring that up. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this is a question. If you've heard this before, don't answer in the chat. Um, but if you haven't heard it before, please, please do. Um, and this is, uh, you know, a question about a uh, terrible thing happens, man and his son, are in an accident, uh, rush to hospital. And when they get to hospital, the doctor in the hospital looks at the boy and says, I can't operate on this boy, uh, he's my son. Um, now, the question is, and as I said, don't answer if you've heard this before, but how can it be that the doctor is the person's son? So please do put some stuff in the chat. Any ideas? Right, so one person's already, already got it. And, and actually what's, what's quite interesting about this is, is very few people do, when, when this is, is, has been done as a piece of research, I think it's only about 7% of people um, get the answer. And, and gender plays a little bit of a factor in terms of the gender of the people answering, but actually not that much. And this is a classic cognitive bias. This is, um, this is about the way that we think and part of the way that we, we're queued up to think. So the, the reason I talk about this, the reason this is for journalists, is that journalists work either with information overload, we're kind of filtering down to the bare essentials, or we're working with too little and we're trying to fill in the gaps. And we're always having to do this at speed. And, and all of these are kind of classic parts of cognitive biases. There are almost 200 of these that have been identified. Um, they relate to um, particularly these sorts of problems that journalists deal with. And in fact, a lot of the ethics and, and regulation around journalists, journalism is actually designed to tackle this. So I'm going to rattle through this very quickly and try and get this done in, in the 15 minutes. But first of all, not having enough meaning. Um, and I'll play you a little video clip. The veteran Indian actor Shashi Kapoor has died in hospital in Mumbai at the age of 79. One of India's greatest acting families, he appeared in more than 150 films, including a dozen in English. He starred in some of the biggest Bollywood blockbusters of the 1970s and 1980s. So this, was, um, this is an example of a mistake that the BBC made, but two of the clips in that uh, broadcast were actually of two different actors, neither of which was the person who had died. Um, and this, as you know, happens uh, unfortunately too often. And the, the, the classic example recently was the, the case of a, a black MP, the wrong picture, picture was used. Um, I think it was in a broadcast and then the, a newspaper piled in and they actually used the wrong uh, picture, captioned the wrong picture as well. And then they blamed the photo agency. Um, these are all part of a, a really important cognitive bias called um, uh, out group homogeneity bias and it's it's the, the fact that when we're looking at groups we're not a part of we see them as more homogenous than they are and what's really useful about this is is the problem with racism and a lot of this is to do with racism and there were cries of racism in both of these examples um, is that people don't think that they're racist 
And in some cases, people make racist mistakes while not being racist. But out-group homogeneity is much broader than racism. It's about this idea that, for example, if, you, if you're young, you probably have quite a one-dimensional view of what old people do. If you're urban, you have a one-dimensional view of what rural people do. And one thing I think we've seen with the, with the coronavirus story is we have a very homogenous view of overseas uh, of other governments, other countries. I think we have a tendency to, to um, believe that other governments are probably more honest than our own, for example, or, or, or are better than our own, or we, we, we're perhaps, perhaps not as critical. So that, that kind of interrogation of, uh, of other groups that we're not part of is really, really important in addressing this, not just at an institutional level, but at an individual level as well. So looking at, at data in particular, in the, in the granular aspect of it, finding out about subtleties really helps. So moving quickly on to too much on information. Um, confirmation bias is a classic example of this. When we're working to a deadline, um, we, we're particularly looking at uh, data, we're, we're trying to find a particular pattern and it's very easy to search for the thing that you want to find rather than the thing that you need to find um, or the, the source that's going to tell you something that challenges your particular view. And I've had some very interesting conversations with broadcasters uh, wanting me to appear on a programme and clearly wanting me to play a particular role and fall into a particular um, uh, category that's going to confirm the, the, the biases that they have. Uh, a good technique with this is to write down uh, what you believe your story to be before you start to investigate it and if your story ends up being too similar to that then perhaps you've you've ended up just confirming your your biases. Um, what should happen is that your story evolves as you start to find out the subtleties surrounding that. Um, a couple of my favourites, which um, are all over the place right now, anchoring effect and framing effect. Uh, anchoring effect, the classic example here is uh, we put something for sale for £1,000 and offer £100 off. And because it started off at £1,000, we think that's a big bargain and we'll pay 900 quid for something that we probably wouldn't have done if it didn't start out at £1,000. Um, so Donald Trump uses this all the time. Um, at the moment, he's... Uh, using this whole thing about, well, it, it could be 2.2 million. So if we only, if only 100,000 people die, then that's a success, a success. And this is a classic anchoring effect. We're, we're setting the price high and then we're giving a big discount on this. Now, the 2.2 million is the figure if no intervention was taken whatsoever. So obviously 100,000 is still a really bad outcome and does not necessarily represent success. Um, here's another example. This is actually from a BBC story. It's actually from a reality check story, which really depresses me. Um, and uh, so this is about class sizes and, and what they've done in this chart. And this is quite common with line charts is they've anchored it at zero. Now, with a bar chart, you should start with a baseline of zero. Um, I won't get into the reasons why right now, but with a line chart, you don't have to. And a key test of this is would anyone ever expect there to be zero? So if you're showing body temperature, if you're showing the, the temperature of the world, then um, you're not necessarily, you're talking about quite small variations having a big effect. If you're talking about class sizes, no one expects class sizes to be zero or even 10 perhaps. So you have to pick a different baseline. And by picking a zero baseline, you're actually underplaying the scale of change in many cases. Um, the contrast effect, this is, this is about uh, what surrounds something. So uh, this blue circle is actually the same size on the left and on the right, but we get a little optical illusion here, which makes the one on the right look smaller because it's, it's contrasted with the bigger circles. Um, I'll just leave this one here. Um, this, is a, this is an example of this recently. Rishi Sunak, who normally would would you know basically look like someone who lost his way on the way to the shops suddenly is looking like a competent statesman uh, in contrast with other people but what also interests me about the daily briefing is that the two people uh, on the side 
in contrast with a politician, uh, have a certain credibility that they probably wouldn't have if they were next to a, a nurse or a doctor. Um, they are still essentially political figures, but next to a, a if you like, a, a politician with a capital P, it makes them look less political. Um, and it's been very interesting to see their, the, the perception changing as, as we start to see some of the political decisions and, and phrases that those people are using. So just because they're next to a politician doesn't make them not political. Um, wrapping up with, with speed, um, this is a, a really useful cognitive bias to be aware of is what's called the IKEA effect. And this is the, our tendency to put more value by things uh, to things that we've assembled ourselves. And I think in news, we can do this sometimes with uh, when we've commissioned a survey or if someone's leaked us information or we've collected information or, you know, there's some sort of exclusivity involved. Um, and I, I see quite often people perhaps being a little bit less skeptical questioning than they would be otherwise. Um, so this isn't necessarily a bad story, but what I find really interesting about it is, you know, it's seen exclusively, but actually the methodology has a lot of flaws. It's a self-selecting sample, so it's very difficult to judge the scale of the mental health crisis, and there is a mental health crisis in education, in, in young people, um, but it's very difficult to judge that when you're dealing with a self-selecting sample. That doesn't give us a, a, an indication of the actual scale of, of an issue. So if, if you're being given stuff exclusively, still do question it, still do uh, be careful about it. Uh, we also have a tendency to um, not give up on projects that we've invested a lot of effort into. That's called the sunk cost fallacy. Um, and it, again, I think it's important that we're prepared to ditch visualizations we've done a lot of work on, interviews that have taken us a lot of time if they don't actually add anything to the story. And um, one last one uh, right now, very relevant with coronavirus, is uh, the availability heuristic. This is our tendency to reach for what springs to mind. So at the moment, what springs to mind is coronavirus. Anything that we say, we are likely, because of this cognitive bias, to attribute to coronavirus. So again, it's important to be aware of that, I think, and kind of question, actually, is that the cause or is it something else? Um, and again, Donald Trump is a classic user of this. Um, he'll draw attention to certain things um, to try and imply that they are causing something else. Uh, the classic one being immigration. So um, to wrap up that, uh, I think a key thing to, to sum up with is that this isn't something that you can avoid. We, we this is, a natural feature of us as humans and um, and we have to be human so uh, one cognitive bias is the uh, tendency to believe that we're not going to fall into this trap we will we do so take steps to uh, negate and reduce the likelihood that this will happen having a good editor is really important as part of that that's why we have editors um, but also putting in other checks and balances into our systems and that's it um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Paul. Very clearly um, presented, and so I suspect there won't be so many questions. Uh, we do have one, which is asking for a recommendation for a, do you have any online course recommendations in terms of learning critical thinking for journalists? Do you um, know aware of any? No, so that's a good question, but there's quite a lot on, um, I think statistic, uh, what's quite interesting is this does overlap a lot with some of the things to watch out with in terms of statistics. So, um, so certainly there's lots of stuff on that. Um, there's uh, How to Lie with Statistics, which is a, of what's quite an old book, is a very easy to read book. Uh, that's very good. Um, there's uh, actually Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, I've not read that, but I know that that does touch on some some techniques around this um so that would be another uh, there's one called the black swan something to do with the black swan i can't remember the full title but that that's quite an interesting one um kaiser fung ha is uh, has written a couple of books uh, and also has the best name in the world 
Um, so I, I'd recommend his stuff. There's some really good stuff on false positives and negatives in his first book, which is going to be very relevant uh, as we start to get into testing um, around coronavirus. Um, I, I think that's been made out to be a lot simpler, a lot easier than that is going to be. So, um, yeah, Hans Rosling, someone's mentioned that, factfulness, that's, a, that's another one. Um, the Tiger That Isn't, or The Tiger That Wasn't, is another. Um, uh, yeah, so there's, there's loads of really good ones on statistics, and a lot of those were essentially touch on these sorts of areas. The Black Swan, thank you, by Nassim Taleb, yeah. I'm enjoying the group participation and yeah. sharing, their, sharing their thoughts too. So thank you so much, Paul.